So uh, good good evening, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity. Um, I think as the weather gets better and more and more of us have the opportunity to go outdoors and start spending some time in the pool or swimming or playing some racket sports. Unfortunately, uh, some of us may develop some shoulder pain. So the topic of tonight's talk will be shoulder pain and how to treat it. My name is Dimitri Delos. I am a shoulder and knee surgeon with the orthopedic and neurosurgery uh, specialist group uh, with locations in Greenwich and Stanford, as well as Harrison. And I'll be presenting a short uh, talk, a, a basically a review of shoulder pain, the various conditions that contribute to shoulder pain, and the best ways to go about treating shoulder pain, especially non-operative ways uh, in which we can get better. And towards the conclusion of the webinar, certainly I will welcome uh, anyone's questions and I'll be happy to answer them at the conclusion of the talk. So briefly, we'll touch on shoulder anatomy. When we think of shoulder conditions, we can sort of categorize them into three different uh, buckets. We can have problems that involve the tendon and the bursa. Uh, we, we can have problems that involve the labrum or the ligaments. And we can have problems that involve the cartilage, which is the cushion that lines the bones. And sometimes we call that arthritis. And we'll touch on treatment for all those conditions. Everyone's heard of the rotator cuff. And we sort of lump it as if it's one thing, but really it's four muscles, each with an indi individual tendon that start out on the shoulder blade and then they end on the top of the arm bone called the humerus on the ball or the humeral head. And the four major muscles and tendons, we give them the names of the supraspinatus, the infraspinatus, the teres minor and the subscapularis. What they do is basically three major things. One is abduction, which is to bring the arm up and elevate the arm. And probably the more important one is the supraspinatus. Two of them are involved in rotating the arm outwards. That's what we call external rotation. And those include the infraspinatus and the teres minor. And then we can bring the arm closer to us over our chest using the subscapularis. So the subscapularis is in the front, uh, two of them are in the back, and one is on top. What's the shoulder bursa? So a lot of people have been told they have bursitis or whether it's in the shoulder or in the hip or somewhere else. The bursa, all it is really is a fluid sac that's typically relatively empty that surrounds the tendons to protect them and allow for smoother motion. And also as you move the bones, it prevents the tendons from rubbing up against the neighboring bone. Now, the other thing I'd like to mention in, in the zip, same zip code as the rotator cuff and the bursa is the long head biceps tendon. And so the bicep is called bi, uh, it, or at least it has uh, the letters uh, bi uh, because there's two heads to the bicep. And the two different portions of the bicep are called the long head biceps and, and the short head biceps. And the long head has a tendon that courses into a groove on the front of the arm bone that will attach uh, somewhere in the shoulder joint. And we'll go into that into a little, uh, in a little uh, detail later. Now, probably the most common thing that affects people who come into the office and tell me that they have shoulder pain is something we call impingement syndrome. Sometimes we'll also lump it in as rotator cuff tendonitis or bursitis. It's probably the most common shoulder condition leading to pain. And the pain, ironically, is usually along the side here. And I say it's ironic because the shoulder, most of us will point here, but the pain will typically be more on the side of the arm. Now it can be in the front or the back, but usually it's on the side. And the other thing that people will report oftentimes is that they have trouble sleeping at night or rolling onto it. And of course, the other things that will cause pain involve 
reaching outwards, reaching above your head. Uh, it's the serve in tennis. It's common in swimmers. Uh, and even putting, you know, even doing simple things like putting on a shirt or a jacket uh, can be difficult at times. And we touched upon the long head biceps. Much like the appendix, people still have, you know, doctors still haven't figured out exactly what it does. We think it's probably a vestigial uh, piece of anatomy because you can live with it or without it. Uh, there are people who've had the bicep tendon, the long head biceps tendon tear on its own. A lot of professional athletes have had that happen and they can still function quite well. The main thing with the long head biceps though is that if it starts getting frayed or inflamed, it can be a very, very potent source of pain in the shoulder because it's in a very, very, very tight spot there uh, in a groove on the end of the, of the arm bone and uh, and it also where it attaches onto the shoulder labrum, uh, you know, those sort of things can lead to a lot of pain. So what do we do for the various forms of tendonitis, bursitis, or impingement syndrome? Well, most of us have heard of a lot of, a lot of these things that we'll try out. Obviously, modifying your activities. If you're used to doing CrossFit and doing a lot of military presses and bench presses, you might have to back off. If you're used to doing a lot of overhead repetitive things like swimming, you may need to back off a little. You can experiment with ice and heat. Which one works best is not always easy to tell. I think, you know, for most people, I would, I would say experiment with one, try the other, see what works best for you. A lot of people aren't always fans of taking medications and I completely get it, but we're talking about an inflammatory process and using anti-inflammatories daily for a period of 10 to 14 days or even up to two or even up to three weeks. If you take them as directed and you take them with food, oftentimes they can lead to improvement of symptoms. And really the hallmark is going to be a physical therapy or home exercise program. As we'll see, the beauty of the shoulder is that it has tremendous amount of motion, but it's inherently unstable as a result. And so all these different muscle groups, whether it's the rotator cuff, the deltoid, the bicep, all of them, and by the way, the shoulder blade muscles, all of them have to work in concert to really have a healthy shoulder joint. And so strengthening each and balancing out the muscle groups is gonna be critical to improving your symptoms. Now on occasion, we will do injections, typically a cortisone shot. Sometimes we'll even consider something like platelet-rich plasma. Uh, but we'll usually do that if you can't improve using the other things. And in some cases where people are not getting better or there are other things that are concerning, we'll consider an MRI. Now, what we first talked about does involve the rotator cuff in terms of the impingement syndrome and tendonitis, but rotator cuff tears are truly a different, uh, a different problem. A rotator cuff tear means that the tendon, as it attaches onto the bone, has been disrupted in some way. And there's a whole, you know, there's a whole spectrum of rotator cuff injury. You can have a partial tear or you can have what we call a full thickness tear. And as you might suspect, a partial tear is typically less serious than a full thickness tear. Full thickness tear means that at least some of the tendon has peeled off completely off the bone. You can have an acute tear. Say you were trying to lift something heavy or something that you were holding just dropped all of a sudden. That might lead to an acute problem, whereas most tears are degenerative and chronic. And then of course, do you have one tendon that's involved or do you have multiple? We said that there are four rotator cuff tendons and they each play a significant role, but if you have more than one tendon, as you might expect, if you have more than one tendon involved, it's probably gonna be a bigger problem. How do we treat rotator cuff tears? Well, in the beginning, oftentimes, we will try physical therapy. Physical therapy to strengthen the other rotator cuff muscles and tendons, as well as the deltoid and the shoulder blade muscles, can really be effective at improving your symptoms and your function. However, we do have to take into consideration the fact that 
studies clearly show that if you have a full thickness tear, meaning that a, you know a, all the tendon that attaches to the bone has peeled off, the risk of increasing the size of that tear and leading to worsening function over time with non-operative measures, um, the risk of that happening is real. And so we have to take all of that into account. So we will oftentimes consider physical therapy, uh, but in certain patients, if they're younger, more active, if, if it's an acute thing, if it involves more tendons, for those people, we may suggest arthroscopic surgery. So that involves the rotator cuff tendons and the bursa. Now we move on to something called the shoulder labrum, as well as the ligaments of the shoulder. The labrum is really just a rim of cartilage. It's this, it surrounds the socket 360 degrees uh, to deepen the socket and provide more stability. Now, labral tears are relatively common. We oftentimes will see them with shoulder dislocations or we see them in more chronic degenerative processes like arthritis or just with age. And in certain ath athletes, you may have heard the term a slap tear. Now, a slap tear is simply an acronym for superior labrum anterior posterior. That's where the bicep tendon attaches. That bicep tendon we talked about, the long head biceps tendon attaches to the top part of the labrum, and that can be a source of pain. And then the ligaments and the capsule are what connect the ball with the socket. That's what provides the most intrinsic form of stability or the deepest layer of stability in the shoulder. So what is instability? Instability is basically when the ball starts to slide, pathologically so, uh, an excessive amount against the socket. And you can have a subluxation, which is where the shoulder, the ball slides a good amount, but maybe doesn't go off the socket completely, or you have a complete dislocation, which is where the ball is completely off the socket. And unfortunately, this is one of the problems with the shoulder. It's the most commonly dislocated joint, specifically because it has so much motion, because to get that much motion, you have to have an in inherent amount of instability. And the other thing to remember, if the ball is gonna completely go off the socket, Usually to do that, your ligaments and your labrum have to be stretched and possibly torn. Now, acute dislocations, dislocations that happen all of a sudden may require treatment in the emergency room. Unfortunately, in people who have recurrent dislocations, and those do lead to pain as well as the instability problem, sometimes they can pop it back in themselves. Usually the first time though, you will require someone a medical professional to do that. Oftentimes in the beginning, we'll place people in a sling, we'll use anti-inflammatories as needed, and we will usually treat this with rehab. Um, we do recommend surgery in very specific cases. People who keep having dislocations that lead to a very uncomfortable feeling, obviously very painful uh, type of symptom, uh, types of symptoms, and obviously decreased function. Those type of people who can't get better with rehab and conservative treatment are likely good candidates for surgery. And in certain groups of patients, for instance, the young athlete who plays something like football or rugby, those type of people have an extremely high recurrence rate, even in the best case scenario with the best physical therapy and all the best treatment. And in those people, if they choose to go back to those collision sports, usually will recommend surgery even after the first dislocation because the studies clearly show it is protective for their shoulder. Now the other thing I want to touch on that involves that deepest layer of the shoulder, the, lab the, um, the ligaments or the capsule is something we call frozen shoulder or adhesive capsulitis. And the truth of the matter is no one's really sure why that happens. Why does the shoulder get so tight and you get a frozen shoulder and you can't move the arm? No one's really sure, although it is associated with adult women, especially those with endocrine conditions like diabetes or hypothyroidism for some reason. What is going on? Well, as you can see in this picture, uh, 
A normal joint, usually when you look at the ligaments, they're shiny and white. In a frozen shoulder, the ligaments are really, really thick and tight and they're extremely inflamed. And what happens is over time, the shoulder gets tighter and tighter and any movement causes significant pain and you can't move the joint very well. How do we treat it? Well, luckily, we rarely need surgery for this. But by the same token, there isn't really anything I can recommend that can make it go away overnight. So it is going to involve a lot of stretching and a lot of rehab. And typically, I would recommend a course of two to three weeks of a strong anti-inflammatory taken as directed, of course, as long as it's not irritating your stomach or there are no other reasons you can't have it. And oftentimes, we will consider a steroid shot to jumpstart everything and get that shoulder loosened up. Now, the last thing I want to touch on, we touched on the tendons and the bursa. We touched on the labrum and the ligaments. What else can cause pain? Well, on a structural level, probably, you know, the most fundamental thing is the cartilage. It's what, li it's what lines the bones. And where bones rub together, that's a joint. To make or allow for smooth friction-free motion, you need healthy cartilage. And so here on the image, you can see the ball has a portion of it covered with cartilage and the socket is covered with cartilage. What's arthritis? Arthritis, in the most basic sense, is the loss of the cushion on both sides of the joint. So in a ball and socket joint like the shoulder, you lose cartilage on the ball side and on the socket side. Now, glenohumeral or shoulder joint arthritis is not as common as hip or knee arthritis, but it still is very common. And we also see a fair amount of it uh, in patients who've had previous trauma. So shoulder dislocations are very commonly associated and in the, in the long term, especially if you have had many of them with post-traumatic arthritis of the shoulder. But most of the time it's idiopathic. Again, we're not really sure why it happens. Now, the other thing I wanna to touch on is you may also hear of AC joint arthritis. That's pretty common. Luckily though, the AC joint arthritis, even when it's present on an X-ray, typically doesn't translate in having significant pain. And there are, there are ways we can treat it with medications and injections if that's the case. How do we treat shoulder arthritis? Well, luckily we don't walk on our hands. And so unlike hip or knee arthritis, where sometimes I'll have patients that come in with, you know, even a moderate amount or not even that much arthritis in, the, in their knee or hip, but they have tremendous pain, you can have an x-ray that shows extreme arthritis in the shoulder, and yet these patients can still do very well, especially if they're maintaining their flexibility. So I find that if they're maintaining good motion and flexibility in the shoulder, uh, they can tolerate the arthritis relatively well. Not always the case, but just something to remember. How do we treat it? Again, ice or heat, anti-inflammatories, a stretching and rehab and strength and conditioning program. And sometimes we will consider injections if it doesn't get better. Now, <clears throat> as a last line of defense, we can replace the shoulder if the shoulder arthritis is that bad and it's that debilitating. And shoulder replacement surgery is very reliable and predictable, and the outcomes are very much similar to hip and knee arthritis, which has been around for 40 to 50 years. So luckily, the technology in the shoulder has really caught up with the hip and knee when it comes to replacement, and it's a great option in people who need it uh, because they can't get better otherwise. Now, before we go on to uh, any questions, if there are any, uh, I do want to touch on some of the things that can really benefit people in terms of maintaining a healthy shoulder, especially as summer approaches and you may be considering increasing your activities. You'll want to do things that can really strengthen the, the various muscles uh, that are involved in shoulder motion. And here are some cartoons that demonstrate exercises that strengthen external rotation, where you bring the arm away from your chest and your body. And usually these in, will involve cables or bands, 
you can do something where you basically strengthen the rotator cuff involved here. That's the teres minor and the infraspinatus. You can bring the arm down and do it from your side, or you can lie on your side and do it as the cartoon on the right demonstrates. You, you know, we just talked about external rotation, so we want to balance that by strengthening our internal rotators, which are primarily the subscapularis and the pec muscle on the front of your chest. And so to do that, we do the reverse. We use bands and bring our arm closer to our chest, or we can use a dumbbell. You're lying on your side. You bring it closer to your chest. Now, a lot of us will focus on the rotator cuff, but you can't forget the shoulder blade muscles because shoulder motion is coupled to scapulothoracic motion. What does that mean? To move the ball in socket, to bring the arm up like this, you have to also utilize muscles that push the shoulder blade out against your rib cage. So strengthening the scapular muscles as some of these cartoons show are gonna be very, very critical. Um, and you can do these with weights or without. So how do we prevent shoulder pain? Again, you have a variety of muscles that make up the rotator cuff complex. You really want to uh, hone in on each of them and balance those muscle groups out. You wanna work on the deltoid and you wanna also strengthen the scapular stabilizers. That's really the uh, that's going to be one of the keys to really preventing shoulder pain is having not just strong rotator cuff muscles and deltoid, but also uh, strong shoulder blade muscles. I would work on good posture. And anytime you're involved with rep, uh, repetitive overhead activities, just use caution. Um, because if you haven't done it in a while, for instance, or even if you're doing things like painting and you're keeping your arms up for an extended period, uh, you have to be careful that that can irritate the shoulder. So I want to thank uh, you for your attention and uh, look forward to seeing you. Uh, certainly in our office, uh, we're always um, uh, we're always happy to see uh, to see you for any of your shoulder or knee conditions or other conditions, uh, as we have a variety of specialists that can treat everything uh, musculoskeletal. Thank you.